All right, we're just about ready to go. Good morning. Welcome to Point Pleasant United Methodist Church. I'm Dave Samuelson, uh, lead pastor here, and I, I want to welcome you. Welcome you. Um, we, have, we do have folks here. I said the folks that are here are those troopers that uh, came through the, the storm. Those that are here, let yourselves be known. They really exist. They're really here. That's right. Uh, they do get the extra star on their attendance chart. But we, want, we are so glad for two things this morning. Ready? First thing, I'm glad we have live stream because a lot of folks that wouldn't be able to get in uh, to worship are going to be able to worship together. And, and we're going to have a little fun today. In fact, uh, for those of you that are watching on live stream, I want to get familiar with the chat because I'm going to ask a couple questions and I want to see if people, uh, I want you to answer the questions and put them on the chat. So we're going to try that, kind of l- learn to do that together. The other thing is, wasn't it a gift of grace that we had our 125th service outdoors last week, a couple hundred people in attendance last week instead of today? How many think that was a, a gift from God? My gosh, that was uh, incredible. Can you imagine if today was the day? I don't even know what we would do. So fortunately, we didn't have to do that. And uh, so we have just a wonderful couple of pictures I'm going to show you. First of all, I want to thank uh, all those behind the scene, our lay leaders that were uh, deeply a part of last week, um, uh, Carrie and uh, Hank Smith and Chris and Rick Huffman and uh, Ted Price and Deb Semenich um, did a lot of behind the scene. We had a committee of folks and uh, I thanked them last week, but they did a great job. Um, but um, we had a great celebration. And when you have a great celebration, you need to celebrate the celebration. And we're going to do that just real quickly right now. Uh, Just a few pictures of the day. And uh, there was lots of people sharing from their hearts and presentations and and this wonderful um, uh, presentation of of persons that are in our cemetery. Uh, You can see them up there. You know what? I got the, I didn't get the T. That's, that should be Jacob Schultz with a T. Isn't that right, Neil? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a T. You know, one of the things you have to learn when you pass through Point Pleasant is there's two Schultz, two ways of spelling Schultz, two different families. Anyway, that first one should be, I think the rest are accurate. Uh, there's Bud and Leanna and Barry and Jamie and, Jer- and Jeremy bringing people to life. It was wonderful. Yeah. Um, we all learned some stuff we didn't know about our history. And, uh, and, and the presenters did an incredible job. So if you get a chance, let them know how much you appreciated that. And we had great music and uh, presentations, VBS presentations, uh, Celeste and Marcy and Leanna and uh, SSP, the Kings and, and um, uh, Russ and Patty and Linda. Um, brought us up to speed on what a rich and wonderful thing. And we had this incredible choir that sang a song that we've been singing for 75 years. And we had lots of people there. Again, that's a reminder what it was like last week. And uh, it's a little different out there right now. So, so thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to hand it over to you. There we go. I hope you guys are enjoying. I don't know if you can see, we have some beautiful garbage can decorations around because we're reminded that with the rain, we also have a roof and a roof is making itself known today. So anyway, glad you're here. All right. So next Sunday, so we had beautiful weather last week. We got beautiful rain this week. We're going to have beautiful weather next week. I haven't looked at the forecast. I'm just claiming that. Um, So yeah, next Sunday is Halloween. uh, And we're going to do the same type of event as we did last year, which is extremely successful. Uh, We're going to do trunk or treating. Um, If you haven't signed up for a slot yet, there's definitely still time. Uh, You can either reach out to the church office or uh, Carrie Smith and Linda Harrell are in charge of organizing it. So, uh, yeah, we're encouraging folks, if you're not going to be passing out candy at home, come on out. You can either donate candy to this or even better would be to to claim your own little trunk or treating space. So the neighborhood kids, kids from the church 
can, uh, can come out and enjoy themselves. So that'll be next Sunday from five to seven. We also have the gifts of Laura Bemis, our resident professional photographer who will be uh, taking family photos. So uh, I'm always lacking in family photos. So I'm looking forward to it for that if nothing else. So should be a good time, five to seven next week. Oh, all right, now we're into it. Uh, so evidently we've crossed the threshold from ice cream weather to bagel bites weather, which I gotta be honest, I'm a man of the people. I could do ice cream or bagel bites. Um, but this week, uh, yeah, so little pizza snacks it should be delicious. And anything else? And then there were no more announcements. Um, so uh, Jeremy Schultz, I don't know if you guys know, Jeremy likes to fly planes. Steven, what are they called? They're like control line airplanes. And so he's down in Madeira this weekend to go down and fly planes. So we're hoping Jeremy's having a good time down in Madeira, even though I don't think there's a whole lot of plane flying going on. Uh, but it's a week for him to be able to do that. All right, I think it's time for us to lift up our voices. Uh, so let's stand up. If you're at home, stand up and join us. Um, and as a heads up this week, uh, the, the story of blind Bartimaeus who laid at the side of the road and cried out, Lord, have mercy. Um, so the idea of the songs this week was trying to, to pick songs that maybe Bartimaeus would have been a fan of singing. So, so join in um, and yeah, sing loud, especially if you're at home. There we go. Oh, come out of sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come kneel earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal so lay down your burdens lay down your shame
Would you please be seated? Please join me in the call to worship from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 8. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice and righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be, will be called children of God. We come to worship you, O Lord, that we might see your kingdom. Amen. All right, we're going to stand up again. Let's do this. You're not getting exercise on a rainy day. So we're going to stand up and lift our voices instead. And just... All right, let's give this a whirl. shadow of death your perfect love is casting out fear even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back I know you are near and I will fear no evil for my God is with If my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh, oh, no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh, no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh, no, you never let go. that is coming for the heart that holds on a glorious light beyond all compare there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes we'll live to know you here on the earth and I will fear no Be seated. 
Good morning. From the 10th chapter of Mark, verses 46 through 52. Jesus and his disciples were coming to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. In your activity bag this week, you have puzzle and coloring pages, crayons, a pencil, and a pair of scissors. They are only for cutting out the crafts. <laughs> you also have a Jesus Heels matching game and a Jesus Heels slider craft. Both you can cut out and play with. Thank you for remembering to bring cans of food for people who are hungry here in Elk Grove. The food collection box is always on the turquoise table in front of the ministry center, and the need is always great, especially right now. And don't forget, you can pick up your very own activity bag anytime from the box on the turquoise table in front of the ministry center, except for today when we've moved that box inside. Thank you. All right, so we're going to sing a, a new song today. It, well, new to us. It's called Lord, I Need You. And uh, as I was thinking and praying through the scripture this week, this just seemed to be the song that kept coming to my head um, as the song that Bartimaeus may have been calling out. So, so let's join in. Lord, I come, I confess Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you.
righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, my Thank you, Ben. And that song was spot on. And uh, you did well. Our need for God, if people can hold on to that, if we can hold on to that, this sermon will work a whole lot better in this story. The title of the sermon is The Power of the Barnabas Story, Realizing That Seeing Is Not Always Seeing. And I want to thank Sonia for reading the scriptures, but I want, to, I want you to hear the scripture again, and um, I want you to hear it with your eyes closed, okay? So with your eyes closed, because our eyes are, yeah, kind of a part of seeing, but believe it or not, the most important part is not our eyes. And besides, Bartimaeus was blind. So we're going to kind of see it a little bit how he did. But as, uh, as you hear the word of this story, Um, imagine it, okay? Here we go. Jesus and the disciples came to Jericho. And as he, Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up. He's calling you. So throwing off his coat, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. So ends the reading of the word. So the story of Bartimaeus is a story about seeing, seeing as opposed to not seeing, seeing as opposed to being blind. It is a scripture filled with incredible irony. Bartimaeus is blind, and yet he sees Jesus for who he is better than just about everyone else. He cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David is a messianic term. It was a term for the Messiah. The word Messiah is a Hebrew word meaning anointed one, anointed one of God. The Greek word for the anointed one of God is Christ. In other words, Christ is not Jesus' last name, even though we almost sometimes think of it that way. No, no, it is an affirmation. It's a statement of faith that we affirm that he is the anointed one of God, that he is the Messiah that he indeed is the son of David. And also, it's important to remember that very, very few people understood Jesus to be the Messiah before his death and resurrection, including his own followers. That's because most people had a preconceived picture of the Messiah being a powerful warrior figure, like a King David. Yet Jesus was not a warrior figure like King David. He was primarily a humble servant and teacher and healer. So ironically, Bartimaeus, who is blind, sees Jesus clearly, 
while just about everyone else, the closest followers were unable to see Jesus for who he is, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one of God. Yet there's another dimension of seeing in the story, of seeing in blindness. Jesus' followers, including his inner circle, didn't really see Bartimaeus, right? They had a preconceived view of who were important people and blind beggars were unimportant. They were irrelevant. They were essentially invisible. As long as we talk about <clears throat> the people like Bartimaeus being that we don't even see them. We filter them out. Such people are to be avoided or at best an object to be pitied. Yet Jesus sees Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is not invisible. He's not irrelevant to Jesus. He's not an object to be pitied. Why? Because he's a human being. And in addition, he's a person who sees clearly better than just about anyone else in that group. And therefore, he sees even what Jesus' followers couldn't see. And how does Jesus respond to this? Well, look at what he says about Bartimaeus' faith. Your faith has made you well. Really, the only thing that Bartimaeus did was identify Jesus as the Christ and believe that somehow in him there was power. And yet that's what Jesus affirms. That's what faith is about, seeing clearly. What if the story of Bartimaeus is really a template of how faith really works? What if faith is connected to our capacity to see clearly with this expanded understanding of seeing? Thus, the sermon title, The Power of the Bartimaeus Story, realizing that seeing is not always seeing. Now, seeing, it sounds so simple and straightforward. Uh, we often imagine that we see what is out there, right? I mean, that's kind of the way it looks in our, in our mind, right? You know, I'm seeing you, and you're seeing me, and you guys are out there, and I'm out there to you. And so it's kind of like, you know, this person's looking at something and, and he's, but you know, it's funny, even just standing in a mirror that begins to break down, right? You look at yourself in the mirror and yes, it sort of seems like it's out there, but really it's all in your mind. That's right. Seeing doesn't happen out there. It happens in, within us, within our consciousness, within our mind. We sometimes say brain, but it's really not in the brain, by the way. So here's a little bit about seeing. <clears throat> so we know that, you know, it goes through the eye, but just to be important that the eye doesn't see something directly, everything we see is indirect. Some light source, that light bounces off the object, it's bouncing off you and going into my eyes, right? And, and vice versa with me. And uh, so this, this reflected light bounces off something out there and goes into our eye and it goes through the, the, the cornea and the pupil and it goes in and then it, it forms on the back of the eye. And on the back of the eye are, and this is kind of a blow up, are rods and cones. They're rod and cone shape, shaped cells. And, and they actually do different things. Um, the rods pick up the black and white and the cones pick up the colors. And by the way, they turn it into impulses and information. It's no longer a picture as we think of what a picture is, right? It turns into information. And so that image actually gets flipped upside down. That's another thing. We'd have to go into that, but it's kind of colorful. Anyway, it goes through the eye and uh, goes through the optic nerve. And then it goes into the brain and it goes into a part of the brain, kind of in the back of the brain, the visual cortex. And guess what? It doesn't become an image there. That's right. There is no little theater in our in our brain, anywhere. There's no little theater that's projecting that image. It never exists as an image in the brain ever, period. So where does the image form? It forms in our consciousness. It forms in our awareness. It forms in our mind. And then it becomes what we think of as an image. Yeah. You will never find the image in any sort of material form. 
It never exists in that way. It only exists in our consciousness. It only exists in our mind. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Yeah. Um, It gets even weirder. (laughs) It's even weirder than that. Um, I've been really fascinated by science uh, that studies near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences. And uh, there's been a lot of research recently on persons who have been blind their entire life that have near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences. And guess what? They've never seen ever, ever in their life through their eyes. And they see, they see images and they'll describe them. And they're incredibly accurate. Isn't that wild? Yeah. In other words, this seeing part is a whole lot different than we imagine. Our eyes, yes, are usually a part of it, but it's much more than that. And it has much more to do with our consciousness, which is much more connected with what we might call spirit, our spirit and the spirit and the spirit of God. When I was a kid, my dad, he had all these great sayings, and this was one of my favorites. And uh, this is free today, but I just love this. As a kid, I thought about this a lot. Uh, It goes like this. I see, said the blind man, to his deaf son, as he took the hammer and saw. (laughs) Now, I would play with this all the time, and I'm not going to do any more than just, I'll read it one more time. I see, said the blind man, to his deaf son, as he took the hammer and saw. You can play with that one with your your kids and grandkids. Um, I was about eight, and that was just mesmerizing. All right. So we're going to have fun today. I want to do a little experiment right now, okay? And uh, I'm excited about this. Uh, it, by the way, it took many hours of preparation to, to set up this experiment. So um, what we're going to do is, again, we're going to kind of deal with this issue of seeing is not all we see. And what do we see? All right, so I'm going to show you a couple clips from our outdoor worship service. And... Um, I want you to look at it carefully, okay? And, um, and then we'll talk about what we see. So here we go. Uh, so watch carefully. And things happen in a certain way. All right. What'd you see? You saw, you know, this bald guy talking, right? Okay. So that's, that's what you saw. And it was a very short clip. And that seemed like that was about it. Okay. Now I want you to look above me and slightly to the left. You can look at the white panel, the, 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 the side of the, of, the, of the glass window, and um, see if you see anything. Look carefully there, okay? We'll show it again. Here we go. And things happen in a certain way. Oh, anybody see anything? Okay, a couple hands go up. All right. Now, one more time, and show one more time, now really focus, you'll see a little black bird fly across Here we go. One more time. And things happen in a certain way. All right. All right. How many saw the bird? Okay. Yeah. How many saw the bird the first time? A couple did. Okay. A few did. All right. Okay. Now, um, believe it or not, there are hundreds of birds in our, our outdoor worship services. This has not happened one time or two times or five times. There's been dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Yeah. So I found one little clip, just a, like a 15 second clip, and there's three birds. Maybe it's the same bird three times. But but uh, anyway, here we go. So this is uh, another worship service, and let's see. God is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs, and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was all right. Okay. How many, saw, how many saw the birds? How many times you see the birds? Someone said two. Someone said three. Okay. It's actually three. I want you to first, we'll watch it one more time. The bottom right happens twice and then literally right across my face. Here we go. Oh. God is like a mustard seed. There was the first one. That someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds. Okay, get ready. When Here's the second grown, coming it is up. The greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come There's and make second. nests in its branches. 
He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was left. All right, so here's my question. How many of you have known that birds hundreds of times have flown across, right across literally, um, you know, the little square there uh, during our worship service? Show of hands. Okay, one person. If you are at home, I really want to know how many have seen dozens and dozens of birds. Let us know. Put it on the chat. And uh, also let us know if you haven't. And uh, my guess is that most of us did not see the birds, even though the birds are, they're, they're, they're there all the time. Yeah, I watched the service right at the very end, and I didn't notice this until about a month in, but then I started looking for the birds. And man, they are there. And uh, I, I, they, I think they're messing with our heads, but uh, they, uh, they are there in great abundance. And so here's, here's the question. Uh, my expectation is most of us did not see the birds most of the time. And the question is why? Now, the truth is, I can absolutely assure you that the light bounced off those birds and went through your eyes. That's right. If, if, if that light, that information, it, it came in, and yet most of us, most of the time, didn't see the birds. How come? How come we didn't see the birds? And the answer is because of our intelligence. That's right. Our intelligence. Your intellect or intelligent filters out most of the information that comes in through your eyes, through the optic nerve into your brain. Hundreds of birds are present in that information over the last year and a half, but you didn't see most of the birds. Maybe you saw none of the birds. The birds were filtered out because they were not the priority. That's right. They were filtered out because they were not the focus. You were focused, I hope you were maybe on the, the, bald guy speaking, right? Yeah, but, but, but not on the birds. And so it's your intelligence. Believe it or not, 90% of the information that came through your eyes, probably 95%, um, you filtered out. It's just a distraction. It wasn't important. It was irrelevant. Kind of like a blind man begging on the side of the road, you know, has no meaning, right? But the information was there. Yeah. But somehow you saw it, but you didn't really see it. It was filtered out. In fact, some of you actually might have seen the birds early on, and then as time went on, you stopped seeing them because it was not new information. People that live near trains, they stop hearing the trains. Why? Because your mind, your brain, your intelligence says, oh, it's nothing new. It's just the train. So you don't even hear it anymore. One of the reasons why so many Jews turned on Jesus was because they had a preconceived expectation of the Messiah, of the Christ, as being a King David-like warrior. And Jesus didn't fit with that image. The truth is, most of the time, only what we see is what we already think it's going to be. That's right. And if we don't think it's going to be that way, it can happen, but we won't see it. Yeah. Those of you that ride bikes, you know, when bike cyclists are hit by cars, often the, the driver will say, I just didn't see him. And they're being honest because they didn't expect them, so you don't see them. That's the way the mind works. But there's a problem. What if what we see and what, what gets filtered out, we filter out the really important stuff? What if God is really trying to communicate with us some really important stuff, but guess what? We don't have a concept of that already. And so we don't have a concept of that, and so we just keep filtering it out and filtering it out and filtering it out. That's one of the biggest problems with human beings is that we often don't change because we limit what we see to what we already know, what we already believe, or the way we want it to be. So what happens if the Spirit of God is trying to change us and transform us, but we just keep saying, no, 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 we just filter that out. Yeah. Well, within... (laughs) the deep and rich tradition of Christian worship, there's a fairly well-known and developed concept known as liminality. Liminality is what makes some worship electric, where people sense that they are tapping into the Holy Spirit, even though there might not even be any words to describe the sense of awe that emerges. 
It's often used with words like it was sublime, it was glorious, it was beyond words. Liminality has to do with seeing. That's right. It's seeing the stuff that we don't expect. It's seeing the stuff that we don't focus on because it's something that's outside of our, our, our already predefined conception of reality. It may be the, the stuff that is most important that gets filtered out. Somehow we see it. But it's seeing what is not the center of our focus. It is the capacity to catch a glimpse out of the corner of our eye. I say that both literally and also metaphorically. It is new and unexpected information. And that almost never comes out of the center of our focus. How can we focus on something we don't even know that exists? So we have to find a way to somehow open ourselves to what we humbly acknowledge we don't know that we're in need of, that we're insufficient. Yeah. Something that our consciousness has no preconceived template that will never be the center of our focus if that's the only thing because we don't know it's there. If there's something about the way that we are created as human beings that we at times can be jolted or shocked out of our tunnel vision and catch a glimpse of something that's not the focus of our attention. Now, there's a phrase. I already used it before, and it's this idea of catching a glimpse out of the corner of my eye. One of my very favorite songs is Comfortably Numb by Pink Floyd. A lot of people don't know this, but it's based on an epiphanal experience that Roger Waters had at a child. And in the song, he describes that. He says, when I was a child, I caught a fleeting glimpse out of the corner of my eye. That's right. It wasn't the center of the focus. It's like, it, it, it's just on the side. Because the stuff that's in the center of the focus, um, that's not where new information comes. But we catch a glimpse, and just a glimpse. But he had this as a child, and somehow it impacted him. And later in his life, it became a profound experience that he connected a lot of things to. In fact, that's often the way it is, often why childhood experiences are so important is because we don't have as much preconceived understanding. We're a little bit more open and we catch more glimpses because we're not so arrogant yet. Little experiences happen on the margins, on the periphery, almost never the center of our attention. And yet if we're humble, I mean really humble, not I'm going to be, I'm a really humble person, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, when we're really humble, we become aware of our poverty, realize that we've not arrived, that we've not reached perfection, that we're very fallible and broken. And therefore, our focus, our priority, not might be misguided, is misguided. We're all off base, every one of us. And if we can accept that, there's really some incredible hope. We can stop being like everyone else in the story other than Bartimaeus and Jesus. And we can begin to see, if you have trouble connecting with Jesus, being like you, connect with Bartimaeus, being like that. If we're humble and open, we can actually receive new information. Those glimpses out of the corner of our eye, that become those liminal moments, those electric moments in life, those aha epiphanies that are for most human beings the most important experiences of life and the ones that transform us the most. Last week, yeah, keep that a sec. Last week, participated in a shock experience that I shared, <clears throat> uh, a shock experience that sort of has been moving through the Christian church over the last 20 years. It started as an epiphany that somebody had, some Christian had, when reading Jesus' parable of the talents. A totally new thought came to them. There was no pre-existing template. Yes, out of the, person, the corner of that person's mind where the spirit tends to move with the most freedom, uh, he was shocked into thinking about a reverse offering. What would happen if people were invited to be in the story, to be those servants that receive a substantial gift, not a quarter or a dollar or two, but $50, and to challenge them to take that which was entrusted to them and definitely not bury it but rather to multiply it in the building of the kingdom of God. And last Sunday's shocking idea was made even more shocking 
by including young children. By the way, I've never heard of that happening before. So maybe that was a, a new out of the corner of her eye that came through the person that gave this and, and kind of a sense that children need to be a part of it. His children, as young as six. And by the way, the younger ones got a, a smaller, a $5 um, envelope. Everybody was a part of it. Children are often even more able than us adults to have those liminal, out of the corner of their eye experiences. Experiences where you have no template to guide you. You have no template to guide you. So what are you going to do? Those are the, the most important moments in life where you say, I don't really know what to do with this. Yeah. There's no roadmap. There's no preconceived expectations that you have built. That's when life and faith comes powerfully to blossom. Or maybe perhaps you did have a glimpse out of the corner of your eye, maybe even your childhood that somehow informed you and guided you how to respond to that gift. What I want to do is I want to close the sermon with some tangible ways to improve your eyesight. Well, no, excuse me, to improve your seeing or tapping into the liminal of seeing out of the corner of your eye the things from God that truly transform our lives. So number one, learn humility. <laughs> yeah, give up this idea that, uh, oh, I, I got that humility thing worked out, right? Yeah, confess your hubris. That's right, acknowledge your poverty. Those wonderful words from the beginning of the sermon now, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Yeah, that's that's how the kingdom of God is born. When we realize how poor we are, there's an emptiness to be, to be filled by God. Number two, seek to worship with a spirit of openness to things that are not at the center of your current faith priority. That's right. That's not to say your current faith priority is off base, but you know what? You have it arrived. I don't care. I don't care what your faith priority is. It's slightly misguided, and it's certainly insufficient. Your God is too small. And if you say, I got it, you're not going to experience much more than that. Focus on the things that really rub you the wrong way. Yeah, the things that really irritate you, almost always that's where the spirit moves. So seek to be open. Have a spirit of openness to the things that are not your priorities. Number three, devotionally immerse yourself in a Christian stream of thought or tradition that you are completely unfamiliar with. Yeah, maybe it's the one that irritates you, but you're curious about, okay? Yeah, curiosity is so important. So I'm just gonna lift up just a whole bunch of different traditions. Yeah. Uh, maybe you know nothing about orthodox spirituality but maybe somehow you're intrigued by it. So you could read the book, The Way of a Pilgrim. Wonderful book. Or maybe Catholic spirituality. Um, especially if you grew up with any anti-Catholicism in your, in your upbringing. Yeah, take a look. I mean, it's just a treasure load. Anything by Henry Nouwen, Mother Teresa's writings or quotes, uh, Thomas Merton's writings, and plenty of others. Progressive spirituality. Yeah. You know, those rotten, you know, knee-jerk liberal folks, yeah, that irritate you perhaps. Um, yeah, uh, delve into progressive spirituality. Uh, anything by De Anna Butler Bass, any of the recent books by Brian McLaren. Environmental spirituality. There is, this is one of, many people are, are drawn to this right now because there's, there's, there's some promptings that are coming. Uh, there's lots, but my favorite is Wendell Berry. Charismatic spirituality. Um, this one's, I mean, John Wimber has written a number of books that are, that are, that are fine and, and good books, but know his story. How this rock and roller with the Righteous Brothers started the Vineyard Church, which was the fastest growing church in the world for about 20 years. And, uh, and just learn a little bit about his openness to the Spirit of God, especially if that irritates you. Yeah. Science and faith. Um, Stuff by Francis Collins, stuff by Rob Bell. I, I regularly listen to both of them. Rob Bell is a, a podcast that's really incredible. 
Uh, it may irritate you. Some things irritate me. Yeah. Number four, participate in ministries that directly serve people like Bartimaeus. Yeah. Part of the not seeing in the story was they didn't see Bartimaeus. And we're like that too. Who are the people that are invisible? Those people becoming visible is almost guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be a place of learning. So there's lots of things. I, I, someone talked to me about using the $50 for McDonald's gift cards to, to give to folks that are homeless or semi-homless. Um, but we have a Saturday shower ministry. We're partnering with Elk Grove UMC. They have a wonderful ministry and we've been invited to be a part of it. And we've got a team, but you know what? We could use a few more people providing showers. You, you don't shower with them. Okay, all right. <laughs> anyway, uh, making that happen. And then it's just, just kind of just a general thing. Think about stepping outside your comfort zone. Again, we stay within our narrow focus, which may be wonderful in many ways, but guess what? What if God is trying to teach you something that you currently don't have as a priority? So think about things that move you outside your comfort zone. Walk to Emmaus, volunteering for SSP, VBS, Shasta Camp, singing in the choir, quilt frame, community garden, many, many, many ways to find an uncomfortable zone <laughs> to learn new things. All right. So that's the message today. It has to do with seeing and this realization that um, this realization that um, see, seeing is not always seen for anybody. Yeah. So look for the birds. Amen. As we uh, come to the prayer time in our service, we're just going to lift up two things to focus on in prayer. Um, today, I, I want to begin by um, focusing on uh, folks that have been working hard, and this is a great Sunday to do it because this is a rainy Sunday and, and, and most folks are, are, are watching by live stream. And, um, you know, two years ago, we had no live stream. And when we started, uh, when we shut down, we still didn't do by live stream because there was a sense that we had to, we had to do it well. We weren't going to do it half well, yeah, and uh, halfway <laughs> or that other body part. Anyway, so we, we, we created a number of teams. Staff was a big part of that. And so I'd like to, I'd like to really lift up the staff. Um, Jeremy, who's not here this morning, Ben, um, Deb Seminish, and Martin Ellison. Uh, we, we carefully strategized how we were going to do. And then we created this audiovisual team with, with Stephen Bingen. And of course, Jeremy is deeply a part of that. And Mallory Kong and Martin Ellison and Tracy Slavin and Carl Rand and Jeremy Whalen. Those are kind of the principal folks. There's a few other folks, Russ King and, and um, uh, Damien and Daniel Ramos um, that have also been a part of that. And they have actually allowed us to have one of the best one of the better live streams in the conference. That's right. That's right. We have one of the best live streams in the entire conference. And I get told that by my superintendent and others. It, we, we're, and so we started with nothing, and yet out of our poverty, some open to some new things and some good things. I want to I say thank you to that, and that was also a big part of last week. And so um, on this stormy day, the fact that we're probably able to worship in significant numbers because of the work of those people. Second, I want to lift up uh, Sue Navist. And um, as many of you know, Sue um, had a gate in the wind, hit her and threw her in the air, and uh, she broke her hip. And Sue does lots of things for lots of people, and now she's laid up. And uh, so we are working to support her through this time. Uh, she provides transportation, and uh, so we're trying to build a team that can transport. It's mostly the second service, her, uh, her mother, Betty, Betty Martello, and others that Betty has reached out to. And so we're working for people that might be saying, you know, once a month or once every six weeks, I'd be willing to provide transportation um, for three, four people. And um, in addition, uh, today, uh, we're going to start, we're going to have it 
Uh, we'll probably send out the link. We're going to do a food, a meal train, where people can sign up for meals uh, because at this point, that's, that's going to be needed. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, um, uh, we'll, we'll do it probably in a flock note. There'll be a, a link, and you can sign up, and then it'll be on the website after that. So let's be in prayer, lifting up these two areas of need. Lord, we do thank you for the rain that falls. And while we're a little scared of, of too much rain falling, particularly on those areas that uh, are burnt and cannot uh, soak up that rain enough, and so there could be damage and uh, mudslides, there could be some places of flooding, and so we do pray, but we rejoice in our parched, drought, f- endemic land to receive these rains. And we pray that they will be instruments of, of new life. It reminds us on this day of, of being able to worship actually quite well, uh, remotely as well as those that are here in person. Uh, but those that, re- that are worshiping remotely this day, we are grateful for all of those persons that have been instrumental in the transformation that has happened in this church over the last 18 months. We are incredibly blessed, and thank you for um, whatever glimpses out of the corner of our eyes were a part of that. And Lord, we lift up Sue to you. We pray for her healing. We thank you for her, her wonderful care of others that we have an opportunity to step in Uh, In this time, what is a gap for her of not being able to do these things, whether it be providing transportation for those uh, to come and worship, or whether it be providing food for her, for John. Lord, we lift these things up to you. Together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, church, let's find our way to our feet as we're going to sing ourselves out of worship today. I've been told that people listen to live stream while they're driving. That uh, request to stand up does not apply to you. Or the close your eye part either. Yeah, maybe do a little disclaimer during worship. That'll be good. Um, so the last song we're singing today, Graves into Garden. Um, how for me, I see Bartimaeus after, after he, having Jesus heal him and having Jesus, you know, experience what Jesus had to offer. Um, I couldn't think of a song that, that seemed better. So let's join in this together. I searched the world But it couldn't feel me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend, cause the God of the mountain, he's the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh 
there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Nothing better. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn mourning to dancing. You turn beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the To gardens, you turn bones into armies, you turn seas into highways, you're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you, oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Sing that one more time. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for worshiping together with us this morning. Um, after, after the benediction, you can go out and you can, because there's fewer of us, uh, there's more bagel bites, but also because I, all, I had a little flash out of the corner of my eye. Some people are lactose intolerant. So we also have, particularly for kids, uh, Welch's fruit snacks that don't have any milk products in them. All right, please bow for the benediction. Oh Lord, may we go forth humbly aware of our inner poverty, that we might be open to those glimpses we catch out of the corner of our eye that are from you to transform us, that we might not filter them out. Amen.